look at myself and say, what the hell am I doing? <laughs> Sorry. Um, my wife and I and my young daughter we decided to move here in Manhattan. And, uh, we found this little house in Brooklyn. And uh, after that, I, first I thought to myself, well, I'm too young to retire, so um, I was going to find something. Uh, I took a look at the uh, town of Gilbert. Uh, and uh, at that time, there was no story. Uh, I spoke to the uh, town supervisor, and the first thing he said was, How about you becoming a story? I thought about it, and then I said, Well, yeah, I could find out more about the town. And actually, that's what I did. And I became uh, the Gilbert story. At first, I thought it was just that. Uh, so, extra deal. You know, you know, that's my job. Uh, I'm not that way, though. Uh, I'm curious about things. I look for answers. I look for meanings about things. Uh, so, what happened as time passed, I started going through all the records that were in the town hall. I mean, thousands. Not reading every one, but looking at it and seeing, find, finding a piece of information. And, wow, I didn't know that. So now my job as a historian became a little more exciting to put it that way. Um, I couldn't keep up with everything, though. There's too much to read when you try to go through centuries of writing. Um, but I kept it up. And what I did was I started going to meetings each year uh, for registered historians. And, uh, I learned a lot about what it means to be a historian. And we went to different places every year, and my wife and I, and uh, it was like a vacation still. By doing that, uh, after I think it was like five or six years, uh, they said I could take an exam and I could be a New York State historian. So I thought, what the heck? You know? So I became a, a New York State historian. So when somebody complains to me in the town of Guilford, you know, well, I'm going to fire you as a historian. I said, no, you're, I'm a state historian. And I've done that before. So. <laughs> as time passed, uh, the history of wherever we live is fascinating. When you start out, it's oh, yeah, the same old thing. But things start making sense, and things I didn't know about suddenly came to. And I remember I was talking to a woman, uh, Willie Henley, she was 96. I used to go over there almost every day and talk to her. She was a story, even though nobody said she was. She had so much information. I mean, things I would never imagine somebody would know. And to still remember it, 96. And I started saying to myself, there's more to this than what I think it is to be in this story. Uh, I remember one time, it was uh, during the winter, and I was put over to her house, and uh, I said, boy, that's a bad snowstorm. You know? And uh, I said, well, I guess years ago, you couldn't get into knowledge you go shopping, right, Willie? He says, oh, that's the best time to go. I said, what do you mean it's the best time to go? It's snowing out. He says, yeah. But you take your sleigh. <laughs> you know, something so simple that nobody would think about it. You know, today you would say, oh, I can't go to Norway. Nobody says, I because I don't have a sleigh. <laughs> <laughs> simple things like that starts bringing bring forward uh, a piece of history of how we live, how we change, and maybe we can watch where the future goes. As time passed, um, I decided that we needed more than what we had as even me as a historian. I don't know that much. I don't know all those people. But there was a lot of people in town at that time that were pretty well up in age and have a lot of history. So I started going to those people, but I knew I needed more help. And uh, 
uh, that was the time I met my wife. And uh, we decided, you know, what we should do is start an historical society. And that's what I just started, the Guild Historical Society. Um, we elected the president, the vice president, the little building that's right on Main Street, Guildford. It looks more like a house than it does a building that would have a harbor of, you know, 100, 200 people. But we figured well, that'll be okay. And as time passed, it started to grow. So instead of like the five or six people that used to come to a meeting, suddenly there was 20 or 30. And it got a little too crowded, to say the least. And things started to change. Uh, I'm going to ahead of time here, uh, so we could leave. <laughs> uh, what happened was, there was a church, and if you're familiar with Gilbert, uh, it's called Gilbert Center, that's, a, that's the center of the town, really. A lot of people don't even look at it that way, it's just, that's where the town hall is, that's why it's the center, that's not the reason. If you take a look at Gilbert Center, one of the things that really pops out of your mind is, why does that big white building with those big white pillars? And so well, that's a bar. Oh, it looked like something more important than that. But it wasn't. It did turn into a bar, to say the least. I mean, you know, no other stories. You know what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. um, in 1803, on top of the hill, if you look right now, where the, if you're in the pillars, if you look, the hill up there. You would see a road going from the top of that hill right down to the pillars. That was a stagecoach stop. People couldn't get any place without coming down that hill and stopping at the stagecoach stop. That made Gilbert. So when I started going deeper into that, I started realizing something that I wasn't really maybe sure about. That I think I'm in a story. Mm -hmm. It seems to be working. And I felt that. And I wanted to do more. Um, sometimes I think this was an accident. There's a church that's right across the street, a big white church with a steeple that's, you can't miss it. Uh, the minister that was there, she contacted me and said, uh, Tom, would you be interested in you as a story. And I said, well, I have to think about it a while. This building is enormous. Where are we going to get the money? We, we have this little building that people give us like $10 a week or something. How are we going to take care of this building? Who are the problem? But the first thing we thought about was the future. Imagine what we could do. <coughs> Imagine how much history that we could compile in this building. And that's when we get to the chance. And we had to pay for the building. A dollar. <laughs> she trusted me. And our members. So now we get into the church. And it looks like a beautiful church, but it's supposed to be a museum. So as time passed, we just through the process of moving things around. The church pews are still there, but everything up in the front is different. Uh, if you've ever been, and some of you have already, um, it looks like a museum. It has a look to it. As this was happening, I'm thinking to myself, well, I'm a New York State historian. I should be doing some history instead of cleaning the floors here. <coughs> Upstairs, that's the second floor. That's where the orchestra used to be years ago. The only thing that was left there was broken wood, and the ceiling was falling in. We can't, we got to do something about that. So we hired a contractor, actually a friend of ours, who did most of the work on the ceiling. Uh, there's a stair, steps that goes up, and you can go all the way up to the steeple. That's another problem we still have right now because the steam needs paint. Who wants to go up there and paint that steam? <laughs> in any case, we took a look at that room and we started cleaning it. Started making the ceiling look better. Started looking for like a clean place.
things that you could actually work in. And I thought to myself, what I should do is then take those records that are in the town hall, because our supervisor said they're getting rid of the records. You know, you don't need them in the town halls anymore. So I said, George, you want to give them to me? So we had boxes and boxes of records. Thank God if we fixed that wall, that room upstairs. Um, but I started taking, taking in information, like on the early settlements of Guilford. What, 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 what do we know about that? So I started putting it into binders. So in here you find like 1791 is the earliest settlement, and you can read all about the earliest settlement. And I go on and on about what was known and what was written about, and also news articles that deal with that time period. I got my first book. It was easy to write. That's all I had to do was copy everything. Um, but it's a piece of information that is the only piece of information that's left in Guilford. Because they, they removed all the records. So now, this is a record. As time passed, there's more of these. People start giving me information about their family history, uh, about uh, the farm that they lived in, the structures that are around the farm, etc. I made another book. Uh, the advantage of this is you don't have to go through the aggravation of making the book. <laughs> Um, but I said to myself, I, I really think I should have something I publish. Um, I was interested. As, as a historian, I was saying, what I know now should be written someplace. Where do I start? Well, I was in Guilford Center now next to this church. What else is there? What else is there? There's a man and his wife and his kids. Years ago early 1700s that came in there and started farming. He was only there for a few months and his five-year-old five son died. There were many diseases at that time period. Dickinson family was decided, what do you do when you're in an area that has nobody except you and your wife. What do you do? You take that cemetery stone and instead of just putting it next to your house that you, you bought that stone, uh, what you want to do is you want to put it in the center of where you farm. And Daniel Dickinson said it's not going to be a farm. That's going to be the center of the cemetery. And to this day, every cemetery stone that it goes into that land is around Ralph. There he is. Um, I wrote the book on uh, Ralph, and a lot of it deals with this. You look at this and you say, what the heck do I want to know about? This is everybody that's in there what year, and who they married, etc. You know, so you have to have all that data. And that's what I always look at. Include your data in your book. As a historian, that's what I look at. As time passed, it's not just this book, but other books that started uh, made me think that I should write to. Across the street from where I live, I live on Gospel Hill Road, you know, Guildford. And you throw, go up a little bit, and you go to the left hand turn, and I take you to the lake, and you go swimming. The cross of my house is just full of weeds and some trees. That wasn't like that because I found out more information. That was, at one time, a mill. This was the first mill. And the history of that mill was very, very short to begin with. But I've added that to a book I have. 
and I started taking a look at other places. One seems to be, one that I think a lot of you might know, um, if you go to the mill in the mansion, that's the book I wrote about. And you know what I'm talking about? The dinner? And the, the old mill restaurant is still very famous, very famous. And it's famous because of what it did. What it did was unbelievable at that time period. Because you could use the metal to make all the things necessary. As the state we were in, where we could actually build things and make it out of metal. This is why it's called the mill of the mansion. And here's what it looked like, and here's what it is today. And here's uh, the picture of Chester Rockwell. But I saw, the reason I did that then is to take a look not of, of just Guilford Center or Guilford. Take a look at the other hamlets. They are just as important as where I live. It is part of my life anyway. So I might as well write about it, because nobody else wrote about it. Um, it took time. Um, a lot of photographs took me months. One was almost a year or two. Um, I managed to know, get to know the owners, and also um, where they lived across the road from that. It's a big mansion. I used to go in there and she used to give me all this information about the Rockwell Mansion. What was interesting for me then at that time period is that I was growing. I was doing something and it was adding pieces. But I knew myself, if I keep adding pieces, I'm going to forget it. There's no way I'm going to remember all that. Write a book. And even if they don't like the book, at least I can read it. <laughs> that gives me the information. So if somebody comes in and says, you know anything about the old mill? Oh, sure, I'll show you. It's on page 56. <laughs> so writing a book for a historian, and even um, people that work at, uh, for the historians, um, have books put it that way. Uh, somebody who really got into that as an historian. And also, somebody was interested in where we were going as a historical society. Wrote books. It sits right here. Thank you. And one person and other people she knows that really made where we are today in terms of the history of today. That's the way I look at books today. Um, little problems we had when you first got a book, you just had a, it's like a kid's book, you know. Um, Digipod. <laughs> um, I really didn't know where you're going to get copies made. And at that time, I started looking up online Digipod was the place to go. And I said, I'll try it. And it was very successful. And it wasn't that expensive. I thought it would be much more money than it was. Um, and then, but then you get looks better. And there were people that buy it. So you're not selling what's in it in terms of what's written in here. You're, you're sitting, you're buying, you're selling it and you're buying it because of the color. Of the color. It's ridiculous, but I did it anyway. Um, and I started not only the old mill, but what else is on the Unadilla River? Because when people crossed the Unadilla River, then they were on Gilbert property. They were in Shenango County. Before that, there were was no Shenango County. So the more you know about that, those people that were on that river, and that's what that is and shows you all the different places that people live and also the work they did. 
Uh, and people therefore started buying this one. Uh, so I had to write about where I lived, so I had to write about walking down Main Street. Because really, the biggest industries that Guilford had right here. It's not the way you see it today with a bunch of small houses. You know. It's not that way. You know, you, you had the, the iron works right across the street from me. <coughs> right now it's not. But if you want to know what was there, you read the book. Mm -hmm. um, and some people complained to me, you know, you didn't put in about this. What was the name of that person? And I read it down. Mm -hmm. So then you find out more information. So you learn if you buy a book. Mm -hmm. Or you make up a book. Sell. So those, those kept going on and on. To this day, you know what I do now? This is easier. <laughs> but I can't sell it. There's a reason for that because I have so much information and I'm not getting any younger. I have to have it someplace where I can access it. This goes upstairs. And I put it in a bookcase. And then I label it. And most of these books now have numbers. Why do you put numbers on the book? One, two, one, two, three, four, five, six. I go around in that room. I think there's eight bookcases. I got 623 of these. 623. These are what people gave me, information, or what I wrote, or what I found. I put them someplace. I typed it out. No, I didn't publish it. And at the time yet, I had 600 some kind of pieces of information, but they were all history. Pieces of history that really made where we are today. And that's the way I live. My books. Um, maybe someday this will all, and maybe I'll do that too, take about ten of them, put it together, and say they all would go together. And then when I do that, then I'll have a book. I can't go against this. This is hard. There's pieces that are in these little books that made this, really. So there's more to the story. Um, and I guess there's more to my life then, too. Um, I do things differently. Um, we've been to a lot of places in Guilford. And the gentleman over here knows those places. Yes. And they were fun, but we did. Tom, Tom is the one that got me into doing all this. I met Tom when I was on that, we were both on the board of the land trust, and I went out with him on some of this stuff. We traced the trail, the O and W Railroad Trail, crawling at our bellies under all the honeysuckle. You remember that? Yeah. We tried to find that roundhouse. Yeah. We have quite a few adventures. <laughs> I would suggest that you could do is just have those scan each page scanned digitally and put out an e-book on Kindle. And, yeah. and if you don't need the money, make it something like a dollar. And that's what I'm thinking of. That's moving this out of here. You know. and it would, yeah, because this is the only copy. Yeah. And if you had an e-book, it would be all over the place. Yeah. And so you might be able to get a grant to have something, because it's laborious to scan these things. Yeah, somebody has to yeah. put it in, take it out. Um, but that that way you can get it done in your yeah. lifetime. Because I do have information that is scanned. It's not even in these books. So moving this into do it scan, you know, I could do that. It would take forever, but no, maybe somebody get, else will help. If you could get a grant. And get a grant for it, yeah. And then there are places that <laughs> jobbers that you can hire to do this. Right. I get my scans done at the Copies Plus, and uh, I just leave them there, and I, I, I can either wait, you know, because I only get a few at a time, but I suppose you could contract with them as a, 
this is an enormous, if it's 600 books, how many right pages, yeah. how many individual pages, each side, you've got them on both sides. Everyone's different. Hmm? Everyone's different. Oh, the, how many pages? Yeah, uh, this would be maybe 10, 15 pages. I get some that are 30. So it that's, depends on what, that's what it's about, you know. Yeah, but boy, this would be worth it. Especially the early ones. Yeah. Those are the hardest ones. Probably. So that's where we are. The historical society is still there. <laughs> the church is still there. We still clean the church. Still paying the bills, the church. If you got yeah. nothing to do and you want to help clean, you know, <laughs> um, we've grown a lot. Uh, recently, we, we got some real bad news. Um, we had enough money, people donated throughout the country to the historical society. And uh, uh, sorry, uh, let's see, Scott, it was, it was Scott was our president. And he's done a great job. Um, we need somebody to take care, take care of money, and Clyde does a wonderful job. Um, he did receive a phone call uh, a few months ago saying that you could give more interest if you move your money into this bank, you know. Yeah. So we said that would be good, you know, it would help us a lot, you know. That, I think it was. Eight thousand, nine thousand, maybe ten thousand dollars which we're gone right now. It was stolen. So we're out. We're selling hamburgers and hot dogs and everything else you can think of so we can make it through, especially in the winter. That's the hardest time. Nobody goes in there in the winter, but you gotta keep it warm. Yeah. So every month is a thousand bucks. So we hope for winter. It'll be like summer this year. <laughs> Thank you.